Welcome to Social Psychology. We're continuing our chapter on um, aggressive behavior today or aggression. So we're gonna continue talking about uh, aggression and we're now on the next goal of uh, aggression. Uh, one goal, another goal of aggression is to basically gain material and social rewards. So we're gonna talk about social learning theory of people basically can learn to be aggressive. We're gonna talk about glamorized violence in the media, violent, how violent, and how violent media magnify violent inclinations. Okay, so let's uh, get to it. Social learning theory of aggression. Social learning theory is one of these, uh, what we call the grand theory. It's a theory that uh, one of the uh, general theories in psychology that applies to just about everything, okay? You can learn lots of different things. But of course, you can also learn aggression, okay? So the social learning theory of aggression proposed by Bandura, Bandura proposed social learning theory in general. Uh, it says that aggressive behavior is learned, okay? The reason we're aggressive is because we learn to behave aggressively. We might uh, experience a direct reward, right? We might be rewarded for aggressive behavior and therefore learn that it's something we should do. Um, this might not be the best example, but it says there that, you know, father buys his son ice cream after he wins a fight or something like that. Uh, that sounds a bit extreme, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, another example would be maybe, you know, the son was in a fight um, and, uh, and then he gets home and he looks a little beat up and the father asks him, what happened to you? And the son says, well, I was in a fight. And the father says, well, did you kick his ass? And he says, yeah, I kicked his ass. And I go, oh, good boy. He gives him a high five or something like that. There are parents like that. Teach their kids basically to be tough, stand up for themselves. You know, if somebody picks on you, kick their ass, that kind of thing. Some people are directly rewarded for aggressive behavior, okay? But you can also learn aggressive behavior vicariously by observing others. You can watch other people being rewarded for aggressive behavior. It could be in person, you could see it in person, you could see it on TV, on the internet, right? But an example would be a television character, right? Wins the girl of his dreams as a result of killing several people. He, get, he kills all the bad guys and he wins the girl of his dreams. We see that in the movies a lot, right? So, you know, the character there is being rewarded for aggressive behavior, or violent behavior, okay? And the theory basically says we observe that, right? We observe behavior, we observe a positive outcome, and then we're more likely to imagine, right, that we too can be rewarded for that kind of behavior. Whether it can happen, you know, through watching things in the media, right, or live, right, that's a, a matter of debate. Some people believe that the whole thing about learning aggressive behavior, right, through watching violent TV or playing violent video games, the media, which we'll talk about later on, that is actually overblown and doesn't really happen, we'll talk about what the research says. But the social learning theory of aggression basically says that we learn aggressive behavior. We can be rewarded for aggressive behavior or we can watch other people be rewarded. And yes, it happens in the media, right? Media, uh, violence is glamorized in the media. And research, and there's a lot of research on this, thousands of studies about this, but Research basically says, if you look at it in general, that watching violent TV is correlated with more violent behavior, not correlated, right? That means it's associated. But does watching violent TV actually cause people to be more aggressive? Okay, because if it's correlated, well, that means that they just go together. But does that mean that TV is watching violent, the TV, violent TV is causing people to be aggressive? Or is it that those that are aggressive choose to watch violent TV? right? Uh, what is the direction of the effect? What's causing what? So correlated doesn't, when some things are correlated, it doesn't really tell you that. But the results are confirmed by experimental studies in which violence is controlled. Other research is actually, that actually involves, you know, experimental studies that get at cause and effect have confirmed the results, that it's not just the correlation, that there's actual cause and effect there. And meta-analysis also confirmed these results studies comparing many other studies of aggression and TV. Let me explain what a, a meta-analysis is. A meta-analysis is basically a study of a bunch of studies. So rather than doing your own experimental study, what you do is you basically collect, you know, research or studies. You look up studies that relate to a certain topic 
and maybe it's violent TV and aggression, right? Um, you gather those and then you basically, um, you look at the data from all these different studies and you put it into a statistical software program and you statistically analyze the data of a whole bunch of different studies. And you see if overall, you know, uh, you see what overall, what the research says, that overall the research suggests as a whole that yes, you know, violent TV causes aggressive behavior. And that's what the meta-analysis has found. Okay, more advanced studies there. Let's keep going. What about violent video games? Do those cause aggressive behavior? The violent vi video game industry has exploded or the video game industry in general. So many people play video games nowadays. And there is this danger that, you know, well, the popular video games are the really violent ones and that uh, it's causing people to be more violent, more aggressive. Research shows that playing violent video games is associated with a history of property destruction and actually hitting other students. That those that play more violent video games basically are more likely to destroy property and more likely to hit other people, okay? There's other research. Um, there was a study and this is an old study. So the, the video games are very old and outdated and you probably haven't even heard of them, but um, research on newer, video games, right, has also been done. But uh, there was a study that was done in which students were randomly assigned to play one of two video games. In one condition, they got to play a violent video game. And it, this was done decades ago, so it was Wolfenstein, right? Uh, nowadays, I know we have more modern video games, right, that are even more realistic and even more gory, by the way, and more violent. But they got to play this violent video game or a nonviolent video game. The nonviolent video game was Tetris, Right, And the results showed that those that played the violent video games had more aggressive thoughts and feelings afterward, according to Anderson and Dillon, the year 2000. Um, okay, but is that aggressive behavior? More aggressive thoughts, aggressive feelings? What about aggressive behavior? Okay, there is more modern research that looks at that. And I can tell you that there is research that shows that violent video games, yes, will intensify aggressive behavior. However, I can also tell you that, it that uh, just like with other uh, research on aggression, aggressive behavior is intensified when you are provoked. So let's say you play a violent video game, right? And, uh, and then you encounter someone, you're not necessarily gonna be more aggressive toward that person than if you had been playing a non-violent video game. But if you were been playing a violent video game, and then somebody pisses you off, then the aggression is likely to be higher than if somebody pissed you off after playing a non-violent video game. So provocation is, is, is required, right? For those feelings to be intensified, just like with this excitation transfer theory that we talked about last time. What about violent pornography? Pornography, right? A lot of people watch pornography and there's a small percentage of people that actually like to watch violent pornography. They like to watch pornography uh, where uh, men are basically slapping women, beating them up or choking them. It's kind of pretend, okay? I mean, it's not always like really violent, but it's, it's play acting to some extent, but um, you know, it's, it's considered violent pornography. Now, if it'll be real, it's even worse, right? I mean, you're assaulting somebody or raping someone and beating them up, right? But um, pornography is usually just, you know, stuff that, you know, they, there's different types of pornography and they uh, basically simulate different experiences. The, the sex is real, but the other stuff, you know, uh, is, is kind of like the movies, okay? Where they're making it seem that way. But there is pornography like that, yes, where men will, you know, pretend to choke women or pretend to smack them or things like that. And there are some men who enjoy that kind of pornography. There is research that says that uh, there's both correlational and experimental research that says that there's a relationship between pornography and men's hostility to women, okay? For, particularly for violent pornography, that men who watch violent pornography are more hostile to women and basically more likely to be aggressive toward women. And it's more likely also among men who have several risk factors for violence against women. Men who have certain risk factors, like men who are, who are basically promiscuous or those who are uh, basically uh, 
you know, who have been raised in, the, you know, with uh, more of that macho kind of culture, right? So certain men uh, are more at risk for being more aggressive after watching violent pornography, but not all men. And violent pornography is the more of the issue. Regular pornography by itself is, you know, well, actually we did talk about excitation transfer. That could also increase aggressive behavior, but violent pornography is a whole another brand of pornography that is also likely to increase aggressive behavior in certain kinds of men. Violent media can also magnify violent inclinations. In other words, there's people who already have inclinations to be violent and for them to watch violent media, right? Violent TV, play violent video games, that kind of stuff uh, can bring out their aggressive behavior. Research was done where moviegoers filled out an aggression questionnaire as they entered or left a violent movie or a nonviolent movie. So what the researchers did is they basically went to the movie theater and they went to a place where they were showing a violent movie. And as people came out, they asked them, hey, you wanna fill out a survey? And they had them fill out a survey after watching a violent movie. In another location, you know, they had watched a nonviolent movie and they filled out the same survey. Research, uh, I mean, the results suggest that those that chose the violent movie were more aggressive to begin with. They have, they had more aggressive tendencies, more aggressive personalities, okay? And according to the questionnaire as well, they became even more aggressive after watching the violent movie. It's hard to basically uh, say they became more aggressive with a, a questionnaire, right? Uh, but it was a sophisticated questionnaire you know, where they measured personality and they, they try to get at behavior as well. But um, again, you know, there's criticism of this research, right? This is a questionnaire. And uh, is it really the case that the violent TV is causing the aggressive behavior or is it that those that are choosing to watch the violent or the violent movie are already more aggressive to begin with? The research did show that, but also showed that they were more likely to be aggressive as a result of that, more aggressive. Um, there is a way to measure aggression on a questionnaire, but it's not an experiment. It's not cause and effect. Another reason or another goal of uh, aggressive behavior or aggression is that, you know, to gain or maintain social status. So we're going to talk about sex and testosterone and what that does, right? Although it's kind of obvious, you probably know already. We'll talk about insults and other trivial altercations. We'll talk about different opportunity paths. There's some interesting research here um, on aggressive behavior and how it differs depending on, you know, upbringing and situations and things like that. So let's get into it. Sex and testosterone. There's a lot of research on sex and testosterone, on aggression and testosterone. Turns out that, um, as you know, it wouldn't surprise anyone that high testosterone levels are found in boys that are more aggressive, violent criminals, men and women with criminal records, and even military veterans who went AWOL or got into trouble after their service. AWOL you know, basically means absent without authorized leave. In other words, these are people who basically just left the military and say, screw it, I'm out of here, right? They uh, basically broke the law, so to speak. All these kinds of people, they all have higher testosterone levels than people who are, did not do these things. So aggressive boys have more higher levels of testosterone than those that are less aggressive. Violent criminals have higher levels of testosterone than those people who are not violent criminals, even if they are criminals. Those with criminal records have higher levels of testosterone and those who went AWOL in the military. What does that say about testosterone? Okay, it's one of those factors, right? That basically increases Aggressive behavior, um, antisocial behavior, screw this, I'm out of here, you know, I'm not going to do whatever you say, that kind of behavior. But there's more. There are studies of people undergoing sex change operations. Yes, there are people who, who decide to change their sex. And uh, there are women who change their, uh, their sex from female to male, women changing to men, uh, they get, uh, part of the treatment involves getting testosterone injections. That's not the only treatment, but it involves getting testosterone injections. And those women became more aggressive afterward. 
and also more sexual. It turns out that testosterone also increases sexual thoughts and sexual desire. And the will and more of a willingness to sleep around and be promiscuous, by the way. And there are men who wanted to ch change their sex uh, to women, right? They got testosterone suppressants. So they got basically injections, hormones that decreased their testosterone levels, and they became less aggressive and less sexual. Sexual desire went down. Right. So it's very clear kind of what testosterone kind of does. It's something that seems to be, you know, directly correlated with aggressive behavior. Testosterone increases, you know, uh, dominance, aggression, uh, you know, behaviors that involve the, you know, uh, that have to do with seeking sex and things like that. And if you think about it, all those things are related. Sex, dominance, aggression, they are all related. And we see it very clearly also in the animal kingdom. Like when a wolf, for instance, um, if a wolf is like the leader of the pack, that's the higher testosterone uh, male that's in charge and also gets to mate with the females. The other ones don't get to mate unless they sneak it in, right, so to speak, right? Um, and if that uh, leader of the pack gets overthrown, and loses that position of authority, the testosterone level of that wolf goes down. And the one that rises in, in, in status and becomes a leader, the testosterone levels go up in that one. And it's not just in wolves, but in other animals as well. It's, it's something that, that happens in the animal kingdom. That's do with status, aggression, and sex. Those that are dominant, those that are aggressive are usually the ones that get to have sex and get to reproduce and pass on their genes. Let's keep going. What about uh, insults and other trivial altercations? Turns out that insults also cause aggressive behavior. Insults have been linked to aggressive behavior in the laboratory. They've actually done research where people have been insulted. And then they measured their aggression afterward. Uh, literally, where, they, where somebody is basically called an asshole, right? It's all part of the study, right? To, get the person upset. And then they get some opportunity to behave aggressively towards someone where they think they're hurting someone, but they're really not. And those that have been insulted are more aggressive than those that have been not. Insults have also been linked to teenagers' descriptions of events that made them, made them the most angry, right? Not just teenagers, but people in general, when you ask them about what made them most upset, a lot of them describe situations in which somebody insulted them. Somebody said something mean about them or called them a certain name. Teenagers, right, get very upset about that stuff, but you know, so do older adults. When somebody insults you, it's like they're cutting you down to size, they're putting you down, that kind of stuff. It is very upsetting, especially to men, by the way. Okay. College students' homicidal fantasies. When college students have been asked to think about, you know, killing someone or or when they would kill someone, usually. It involves somebody insulting them, okay? Urban gang fights have a lot to do with insults where, you know, one, uh, where gang members basically uh, just say really awful things about the uh, members of the other gang. And basically uh, trying to some extent to emasculate them or, or, or make them seem more fem feminine or spray over their graffiti, right? And put their graffiti over theirs and, uh, it's all, a lot of it has to do with insults, right? Or infringing on their property where they do their, you know, illegal, whatever, you know, crime they commit, right? Whether it's selling drugs or whatever it is. But uh, yeah, insults are a big thing, right? That drive uh, urban gang fights. Uh, a substantial portion of male homicides have to do with the insults, where it, what basically happens is, Somebody says something mean to another person and that person says something mean back and, and it just gets worse, it escalates. And before you know it, they're fighting each other and sometimes they kill each other. And it sometimes usually started with something really stupid like an insult. But sometimes for some people, it's hard to just let that go and walk away when somebody says something really insulting to you. Like when somebody calls you an asshole, for instance. I have a big problem with that. I'm not saying I'll kill someone, but um, 
yeah, somebody calls me an asshole, right? I get really mad at that. That seems to be particularly, you know, insulting. I think not just to me, but a lot of males, right? And um, when my wife wants to get really mad at me, that's what she'll do. She'll call me that. And I'll get so pissed off and then I'll start to cuss as well, right? Like, how dare you call me that? Like, it's just, it's just very insulting right? if somebody calls you that. But yes, insults have led to a lot of fights and even homicides and things like that. Now, I don't get physical, physically aggressive or you know, want to kill anybody, but it is very insulting and it gets you very upset, right? But you have to be able to control yourself. Some people do and some people do not. I, I had a, you know, uh, it's happened throughout my life too. A cousin of mine called me that. We didn't get into a fight, but let's just say we were basically right in front of each other, you know, like basically challenging each other. Like, yeah, you want to start something? You want to call me that again? You know, that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> and it's just that kind of thing, right? Where a lot of men actually don't want to deal with that. I mean, just don't want to put up with that. Somebody just insulting them to their face, right? It's very, very, uh, it, it makes them very angry. Other trivial altercations or other things that have to do with insults and trivial altercations, there's something known as the culture of honor, which is something that people from the South are more likely to have, to have been raised with. The culture of honor is a set of societal norms with the central idea that people, particularly men, should defend their honor with violent retaliation if necessary. In other words, we are men of honor and we do not take kindly to people insulting us or our family or anything about us. And if people do that, we're gonna defend ourselves. We're gonna beat those people up. We'll kill them if we have to. We don't put up with that. That's the culture of honor. Something that's very common in the South where men are raised that way, okay? Uh, not everyone in the South, but a lot of people raised in that sort of way. Southerners, yes, have more honor related homicides. Southerners are more likely to kill each other over defending their honor. Somebody insulted them or somebody insulted their sister or their mother or somebody slept with their sister and they're not married and disgraced the family. So then they have to go and kill that guy. Um, it used to be more common in the past and that's less common nowadays, but Southerners still that have been raised with the culture of honor still get more upset and more likely to become aggressive when you insult them in some way, or you insult their race. Yeah, say something about the white race being bad to these white Southerners, and you'll see they're not gonna like it very much. And I've had students like that in my classes. And when we start talking about the issue of race and stuff like that, sometimes they don't like some of the things that I say. And I had one of them. He wanted to talk to me after class that he didn't like what I said, right? A white Southerner, right? Uh, he didn't get violent or anything like that. Uh, but uh, he had to tell me that uh, I didn't say anything bad, but this whole idea of, you know, <laughs> of kind of like racism and of these things that certain people have been mistreated and that, you know, some people need to make amends for that. And he didn't like the whole narrative and he wanted to, to tell me about it, right? Um, no, it did not get violent or anything like that, but I usually don't have anybody talk to me like that afterward, you know, but this person did, and this happened to be someone from the South, okay? Um, I didn't say anything bad about the white race or anything like that. It's just that when you talk about racism and things like that, white people don't look very good when you talk about those things, okay? Um, because of the history, right? Of racism and all that stuff. Um, but, um, you know, uh, that was the, uh, that's what happened. Uh, Southerners, even experiments have been done. Southerners are more likely to be aggressive after an insult in the lab. They've actually have uh, measured, you know, this whole culture of honor thing in people, in questionnaires, and they've identified those that have this culture of honor, and they've done experiments, and those that have the culture of honor that have been raised that way are more likely to be aggressive after an insult when they, when they do an experiment. And they basically, you know, really, you know, insult them. They have this experiment and they deliberately like bump into them and call them an asshole, you know? Of course, you know, hopefully a fight doesn't start and not really what happens, 
but then those people have an opportunity to then express their aggressiveness in some other way. Okay, uh, that's usually some other person. So it's actually displaced aggression. Um, and so do the people who don't have the culture of honor. And those that have the culture of honor are more aggressive. Be careful in the South where basically, yes, a lot of people have this culture of honor and a lot of people love their guns too. That was a very bad combination. The culture of honor and gun ownership, right? Uh, more likely to lead to somebody killing you over an insult. Um, other interesting uh, research that has to do with, uh, with the opportunities and different paths to status. So here's the thing, testosterone is something that makes you more dominant more aggressive, right? It makes you want to seek things that are related to that, including sex. So testosterone increases the motivation towards dominance in men. But what happens when men have high testosterone, but they can't be dominant or successful in some ordinary legal way? What happens then, okay? If men can satisfy the motivation for dominance without violent behavior, they will. So high testosterone men, if they can show their dominance in some way, maybe they have a good job, or maybe they'll show their dominance by driving uh, you know, a, a fast car with a lot of horsepower, or they have basically some way, something that makes them look like a big shot where they can say, yeah, I'm the man, so to speak, you know, that sexist thing, right? They're basically saying they've made it and they're awesome, whatever it is high testosterone men are more likely to want those kind of things or want that kind of success, some form of success. Good job, you know, big house, nice car or something like that. You know, it's, it's a way to express dominance. And high testosterone men have a way to express their dominance, okay? So if they have a legal, normal way to express their dominance, they will. They won't necessarily be more aggressive. But high testosterone is associated with more antisocial behavior, more aggressive behavior in those men that are poor, whose paths to success are blocked. Let me explain that. If you're a high testosterone male, you have tendencies for dominance, right? And if you have no way of achieving dominance other than through violence or aggression, then that might be the way you show your dominance. You're poor, right? Your biology is telling you that you're a dominant male, but you're poor. You don't have a good job. You can't afford a your big muscle car or anything like that. Society treats you like crap and you're this high testosterone male. What are you gonna do about it? How are you gonna exert your dominance? How are you gonna, how are you gonna show your dominance in some other way? And sometimes that means in some unlawful way, in some illegal way, or in some aggressive way. Maybe you're gonna be more aggressive, right? And get into fights more. Maybe you're gonna be a gang member. Uh, maybe you're gonna start selling drugs and try to become wealthy that way. Um, and you know what else happens? Maybe you're gonna beat up your spouse and exert your dominance in that way. But that's what research shows that yes, high testosterone makes people more aggressive, more dominant. But if you, can if you can achieve dominance in some other way, then you'll be fine. You won't necessarily cause too many problems. But if you don't have a way, a legal way, a more normal, acceptable way to achieve dominance, then you're gonna achieve, try to achieve it in some other way that's more problematic through aggression, through violence, through abuse, through illegal things, basically. Those people out there, those criminals, right? They have higher testosterone. They are exerting their dominance in some other way. So there was research that was done on people, uh, on people like this, okay? Well, well clarify, poor people, okay? Not, they're, they don't, they're not all like that way. Let me just tell you about the study, okay? Uh, there was a study that was done um, and this is what we call archival research, where they basically search the records of 4,462 
US military veterans, now in the 30s and 40s. Actually, this was done a while back, so now those people are older. They searched the records of these military veterans. They have the records, okay? And there's information there about income and things like that, family background, okay? So they, they divided the men into those from a relatively, so, from le relatively uh, low socioeconomic status. So those that are from poor backgrounds, those that are more poor, and those from middle and upper class backgrounds. They divided them into groups. And, they, and then they compared the groups for evidence of antisocial behavior before joining the military, during the military, and even after military service. And this is what they found. Oh, and uh, yeah, I guess they also measured testosterone. Okay. Um, I'm not too familiar with everything they do in the military when they, you know, run all their tests and, you know, stuff like that. But yes, there are medical examinations and things like that. And somehow they basically knew which ones were high testosterone, which ones had normal testosterone levels. So you have those with normal testosterone levels. Uh, that's in blue. And you have those with high testosterone. Let's look at the high SES, um, high socioeconomic status veterans first. Okay, you can see that those that had normal levels of testosterone and those that have high levels of testosterone did not differ in their levels of delinquency or the level or basically you know, the extent to which they cause problems, okay, that end up being reported, breaking the law and things like that. But if you look at the low SES individuals, those that are poor, then you see a difference. Those that have high testosterone levels basically had a much greater rate of causing problems, of engaging in criminal activity, delinquent behavior, than those with normal testosterone. In general, those that are poor are gonna struggle more. They're gonna be more frustrated, more angry and they're gonna cause more problems in general, but those that have high testosterone will cause even more problems. And why is that? Uh, because for those that are poor, right? If you're poor and you're a high testosterone male, right? Like I said, your biology is telling you that you're a dominant male, but yet you're poor and people don't treat you very well. So you try to exert your dominance in other ways. And what usually happens is you end up engaging in more delinquent criminal behavior. Okay. The people who are middle class, upper class, not as much of a problem because they can exert their dominance in another way. They can be successful in other ways. It doesn't have to be in an aggressive, violent way or in some illegal way. Let's keep going. Okay. So we get to. Uh, uh, the end here, the, the last couple of uh, slides here. And um, we need to ask ourselves, well, what can we do to actually reduce aggressive behavior or to, or to reduce violent behavior? That has not been studied as much as what causes aggressive behavior, believe it or not. But here are some things that can be done. We'll talk a little bit about it, not a lot, okay? But just a little bit. Uh, yes, you can use rewards and punishments. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the cognitive approach that tries to get at the thinking. And I'll even mention gun control, which has a lot to do with violence as well. Not all violence involves guns, but some of it does. And it's a very controversial thing, by the way, gun control. A lot of people are for it, a lot of people are against it. And in general, I will tell you that it's even hard to do research on gun violence in general, because Gun ownership is protected so much that they even made it illegal to even study gun violence in some places or for doctors to collect basically other data on, you know, on a bullet wound or something like that to eat because that's how they can do a lot of research. You know, they can ask, you know, well, what happened to you? Or, you know, how did this happen or whatever is, but, uh, it's such a controversial thing that there's even efforts to basically uh, not even allow research on gun violence. That's how bad it is, right? How much this is being suppressed, how anti-gun control government and a lot of people are. 
So research is hard. Um, there is research on it, but um, there's not as much as, uh, for other th as there is for other things. Okay, so in general, how can you reduce violence? Uh, just some generalities here, some lip service, really tell you the truth. Uh, in general, psychologists feel that punishment is not the most effective way to treat people to be non-aggressive. Sure, you should punish people, right? Uh, when uh, they commit a crime or when they behave aggressively, you should punish them, show them that that's wrong. But that's not the only thing you should do. You also need to reward people when they behave non-aggressively. That is more effective. So if somebody's incarcerated because they committed some violent act, okay, don't just incarcerate them. Don't just punish them. You also have to reward them when they behave more normally, right? When they behave themselves, they earn rewards, maybe more visiting time or other benefits, right? When they behave themselves. What they've done in some places, they've, they've even started a, mentor, a, a mentorship program where you know when they're new, they're, somebody gets to mentor them and talk to them and help them. And, uh, and these mentors basically are people who used to be just like them, who are also violent and, and criminals and things like that, and actually may still even be locked up. Yes, they're, they're, they're still locked up. And the thing is that these people don't just help the people who they're mentoring, it also helps them to be mentored, to be mentors. They're doing something positive, something good. And when they do something like that and they get the reward, right, of helping someone, they actually get better. That's something that you need to do. You need to uh, basically have rehabilitation programs and they come in many forms, mentorship or where they get some, where they, they get to do some kind of job and actually get paid. They don't get paid the full amount that people that, that are not incarcerated get paid, but even things like gardening, or having them engage in some other behavior, non-aggressive stuff. And then they learn about those things and they're rewarded for those things. They're more likely to get better than if you just punish them and lock them up. So you need to reward the non-aggressive behavior as well. That's more effective. Um, techniques for reducing violence, other techniques, uh, Novako's uh, cognitive approach um, focuses on training people to modify their own thoughts. Right uh, to reduce aggressive behavior, uh, Novako, the individual's last name. I don't have a date there, but uh, this approach that he came up with um, says that you know that um, you have to prepare yourself, right, so that you don't behave aggressively or violently when things happen. One thing you should do is prepare for the provocation. Understand that people are going to be mean. Understand that people are going to be unfair. That sometimes people are going to treat you badly, even when you don't deserve it. And you need to understand that. You need to understand that life is not fair. So you need to be prepared for that. That just because you're nice people doesn't mean they're going to be nice to you. And that just, that's just the way things are. You have to understand that and be ready for it. Be mentally ready for it. Okay. So you don't overreact when it happens or so you can walk away. You also need to confront the provocation. When somebody does provoke you, don't just, you know, lash out and try to beat the other person up, you know, just talk, you know, and say, hey, you know, what's going on? Like, uh, you know, what happened? You know, why, like, uh, why are you being mean or whatever it is? You know, sometimes that can get heated, right? It can get worse. But what I'm saying is, you know, use words, not violence, okay? And try to understand what is happening rather than just jumping to conclusions that that person's being mean. Often, many times it's a misunderstanding or the person didn't mean it that way, right? So you need to confront the provocation, right? Coping the, with the arousal and agitation. Understand that, yes, your blood pressure is going to go up. You're going to get more agitated. You're going to get angry. You need to cope with that. You need to take a deep breath, right? Count to 10. Take a deep breath. Count to 10. Slowly count to 10. And then by the time you're done, you're not going to be as likely to just want to just beat that person up or just jump them, so to speak, right? Take a deep breath calm down and then talk, all right? Or then act. And you're less likely to behave aggressively if you just take a deep breath and just wait, right? If you react instantly, you're more likely to be aggressive. Reflecting on the provocation, right? Afterward, something went wrong, somebody insulted you, or maybe you got into a fight, right? Or whatever it is, 
Think about it. What happened? What led to it? How could that have been avoided? Right? What could you could you have done that was better? That would have that could have been better. Those kind of things. It's a mental thing, right? Mentally training you to deal better with situations that might lead to aggressive or violent behavior. Gun control, I don't really have much to say, right? Um, but studies have been done and they've compared homes with and without guns in countries that allow guns and, co and countries that do not. Results suggest that serious gun control interventions could result in dramatic decreases in murders and even suicides. Guns are very dangerous. It's a protected right, constitutional protected right here in the US. So people love their guns and they very protected of them. But we have way too many guns. We have criminals with guns. We have mentally ill people with guns. We have people who are, you know, uh, just, you know, people who commit uh, domestic abuse with guns. Those people shouldn't have guns. A lot of people shouldn't have guns. A lot of people have guns who shouldn't have them. Okay. That's the thing. And whenever you try to pass legislation to make it harder for people to own guns, to take away, let's say, guns from criminals, or to make it so mentally ill people can't get guns, people rise up and they complain and the NRA gets involved and then the thing goes nowhere and nothing ever happens after, you know, like, uh, you know, after shooting after shooting, active shooter here after shooter there, this person gunned down 20 people here, killed a bunch of people here. People get upset. They want things to change and nothing ever happens because the people who lobby basically like the invested in, the, in their interest in guns uh, basically uh, don't let that happen. A lot of people in this country love guns and they believe it's the right to own guns and it is but not everyone should be able to own a gun, just like not everyone gets to drive a car if they can't pass the driving test, right? And research suggests that we'd be better off with more guns, I mean, with less guns, not more guns, with less guns, right? And we if we had more control of that. Yes, people should have to have a license to get a gun. Not everyone should be allowed to get on. You should also have to, there should be mental screenings and things like that, criminal background checks. And a lot of places do this already, by the way, because there are also states, people, legislation differs across states. Um, but, uh, but people, some, you know, but people who shouldn't have guns still wind up with them. Guns should have serial numbers. Maybe they do in some place, or maybe they already do, but uh, you should, yeah, they should be able to trace guns. I guess sometimes they, they wipe that stuff off and they get rid of the serial number so you can't tra trace the gun. But if you own a gun, you should be responsible for it. Keep it safe, keep it locked up. If somebody steals your gun or, you know, it should be reported, okay? Uh, it should be known where that gun is at all time. If it gets stolen, if it gets sold, all that stuff, all that stuff should be recorded. We should need to know who's buying what, where it is, where it's going. And if anybody that shouldn't own a gun ends up with it, it should be known and it should be taken away from them. But people get so upset. If any little thing makes it just a little bit more difficult to get a gun, they get so upset about it. And we have a gun problem in this country. Other countries are basically ridiculing us, laughing at us that we are so out of control with the gun violence. We have such a problem with active shooters and, and, and just mass shootings and things like that. Why? Because they say, well, it's not the guns. It's, it's all these stupid people. It's guns don't kill people. Stupid th people do, you know, or things like that. Like, no, guns are dangerous. Okay, a lot of people die by accident, by the way, as well, right? People wanna own a gun to protect their homes and things like that, that's their right. But I'll tell you one thing, okay? You're more likely to end up shooting your son and daughter than a criminal when you have a gun in the home. You're more likely to shoot your son and daughter when they're sneaking in at night because they snuck out of the house and it's past their curfew. You're more likely to shoot them dead than a criminal. That's the danger, okay? And not only that, people who, end, who have guns, who shouldn't have guns, kids, teenagers, mental ill people, people who have violent inclinations end up with them. And sometimes they kill a bunch of people. There needs to be more control, okay? It, it, it's the way it is. And, but the thing is that it, it's so out of control in this country. There are more guns in this country than there are people. We have over 300 million people in this country. There's over 300 million guns. There's so many more guns. There's so many guns out there already. 
that passing new laws probably isn't going to help because there's so many guns out there already that uh, guns are still going to circulate. There's, there's more than one gun per person in this country. And that's too much, okay? Only some people should own guns, not everyone. And most people don't need a gun, but it's a whole thing about the whole culture and, and that, you know, if the government gets out of hand then we need to overthrow the government, that's why we need our guns and all this bunch of stuff out there. A lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of it has to do with culture and politics and things like that. But it's a very, very dangerous thing. And it's something that needs to be addressed. And it's been going on for decades, right? That people have been trying to do something with this and nothing ever happens because people's right to own guns seems to matter more than people's lives, you know, and it's ridiculous. Okay, and that's my opinion and things need to change. That's it, you guys, I'll stop there. Let me stop recording.